Welcome to Wednesday evening's Bible study. It is the 6th of May. And tonight we're going to be looking at Psalm 73. Psalm number 73. I call this one living upside down. It's a phrase that takes the idea that the Christian life is to be lived in complete reverse or complete upside down of what the world teaches. It's the opposite of how our culture tells us to be successful. So, for example, the world counts greatness by the number of trophies or championship rings a sports person wins, um, an expensive house or a car that you can buy, maybe the number of times your picture is on the front cover of a magazine. The Bible gives the exact opposite. Jesus says, if you want to be truly great, what you need to be is a servant or the least of all. If you really want to be one who is considered first, you need to make yourself last. If someone hurts you, you don't hurt them back. What you do instead is love them and forgive them. So we say, in a biblical ideal, we say no to our ego and we say yes to being to willing to live upside down compared to the world. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, we are blessed when we do that. Psalm 73. Asaph begins on some pretty good firm ground. He starts by saying this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But then he starts to write about the upside down nature of life. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They just wear it around the outside and they can see it. They show it off. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous heart comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds knows no limit. They scoff, they speak with malice in their arrogance. Oppression, their mouths lay claim to heaven, but their tongues take possession of earth. In other words, they think they're gonna own it all. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how does God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Asaph says, in essence, it looks like they've got it made. They've got no worries. They've got enough money to take care of everything they want and then some. Money and opportunity, that's one thing, but not only that, they're boastful and arrogant about it. They're not satisfied with just having it all. They need to rub it in also. So here's a couple of thoughts for us from this psalm and the struggle of Asaph trying to live in what God calls a, a right side up way. First, what happens inside us is more important than what happens outside. Asaph was looking at the outside. He saw how they were living, where they lived, the things of life that they had, their power, their fame, their position. And it made him angry, properly so, and it made him envious, improperly so. Certainly he was unhappy with what he perceived as God's failure to make life fair. So here's the important point. If you're basing all your judgments on fairness and what is right, just 
on this life only, then you'll come to the conclusion, as most people will do, that life is unfair, which it is if you use a worldly scale. The second thing that Asaph struggled with was misinterpreting God's actions or what Asaph perceived as God's failure to act. This happens when we play the comparison game and we've all played it sometimes and this is how it goes. So I played by all the rules but they got treated better than me. They're rich, I'm poor. They're good looking, I'm ugly. They're skinny, I'm fat. They got a beautiful home, high paying job. And me, oh, poor, miserable little me. I've got none of that. I don't think God's been good to me at all. One of the oldest tricks in the book that is pulled by the devil is to get you to question God. And so it'll go something like this. If God is good, then why didn't he answer that prayer? Why didn't God keep that problem from happening in my life if God is good? If God is good, why didn't he step in and do something about it? And it can be anything. Why didn't he stop the drunk driver? Why didn't he stop the cancer or the illness or the hurricanes? Those questions express our feelings, the sense inside us that we know the world is upside down. And we wonder why doesn't God step in and turn everything right side up. But the real question is not done by us regarding God's motives and decisions. Actually, the real questioning done in the psalm is done by God about our heart and our motives. Asaph writes in verse 13, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. That means an emptiness for no reason, for no, there's been no benefit for it. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. So back to that question, if God is good, then why? In 1983, Rabbi Harold Kushner was facing his child's fatal illness. And then he wrote a book that he titled, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. A review of his book, not my review, a review, said this. Rabbi Kushner offers a moving and humane approach to understanding life's windstorms. It raises many questions that will challenge your mind and test your faith regarding the ultimate questions of life and death. Here's my thoughts about the review and the book. Rabbi Kushner struggled with the same questions that all of us have gone through at some time. Where is God and what is he doing? So Rabbi Kushner wondered whether God was completely good, in other words, eternally, immeasurably good and unable to do anything wrong and fully capable of doing good to everyone, but was powerless to help us. So completely good, but not completely powerful. Or the other position he figured was that God was completely powerful enough to help, but not good enough to help. He ultimately decided for himself that God was completely good, but somewhat powerless. But here's my thought. It goes on an opposite track. Why not write a book that's entitled, Why Good Things Happen to Bad People? Because that is what the Bible teaches us, that we have a good God who does good things for bad people for he causes his sun to shine and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous both and the storms of life come and they hit the unrighteous and the righteous also Asaph's thought I've been good has it been beneficial I've tried living life right side up. I see people living life 
right side down or upside down and they seem to be getting away with it. In vain, I've done what's right. The answer to this, God being good to bad people, is found in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's goodness leads us toward repentance? But in all honesty, are there really any people that are completely good? Have you ever met one? I know I'm not. And I've never met a person that is completely good. I've met some people that are pretty good, but no one that is completely good. Isn't there some bad inside every one of us? And if there is some bad, is it fair to ask God to be good to people who have some bad in them? And yet we want God to be good to us when we know there is some bad in us? Rabbi Kushner's book, the reviewer said, offers a, quote, humane approach to understanding life's windstorms, unquote. The Bible offers much better than a humane approach. It offers a godly approach. Asaph continues in the psalm in verse 16. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. God sets the proud and the wicked in slippery places. Their fall is sudden, sometimes shockingly so. Life seems to be on cruise control for them, and then sickness and death happen rapidly. There is a day coming when God will reward those who have served him. He will bring judgment to those who have refused to. This calls for us to trust him and not get our eyes on a world that we've got to tell ourselves is living upside down. We need to live right side up. And when we do, we trust that God will reward us not because we are good, but because he is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge as we look around today, we see people in power and we question their motives and their capabilities. Sometimes it seems like the wrong people are getting ahead constantly and the rest of us who are trying to do it right don't seem to be getting ahead. But we remind ourselves of what Asaph reminded himself. He went into the sanctuary of God and then recognized the end of life. Help us realize that at the end of life, you are there waiting for us. You are preparing a home for us to be with you forever. And God, that is more than enough. You have been good to us who have done wrong. And we thank you for your grace. We simply trust in your grace and the righteousness of Jesus Christ as our only hope. Bless us, please, I pray in his name. As always, we're remaining together in his grip.